but the computer is on. So it's <laughs> Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for a lot to be here. I'm going to talk about query strategies in an uncertain world. Uh, we have put uncertain world in the in the title, in fact, because um, where well, we talk a lot to me to uh, to investors, they are either uh, they could be hedge fund managers, uh, they could be asset managers, they could be pension fund or insurance. And uh, clearly, what is uh, um, showing at the beginning of the year is that uh, it's very very hard right now to uh, to build an asset allocation. There is a lot of uh, uh, challenges and. Uh, just to define the scope of uh, today, I am not trying to give you a macro view on how to allocate, uh, far from it. What I will try to do is uh, um, give a bit of uh, background on the credit market, then talk about the different uh, strategies that can be implemented, not all of them, but some of them, uh, let's say with a few constraints that uh, will allow you to uh, potentially uh, achieve your objectives. And then uh, I will try to put a little bit of uh, a macro element in the sense that uh, we look at three different scenarios and uh, we'll see how these different strategies can behave in the scenarios. We'll see uh, that uh, unfortunately there's not a single one that works in every scenario, obviously. So. We'll start with the landscape. Uh, so when we talk about credit, clearly we have to look at the um, at the fixed income space uh, first. So the, the the slide is here showing the size of various markets: uh, government, corporate, um, quasi sovereign, and also uh, structured credit. So clearly you can see that uh, obviously. Government bonds are a huge part of the fixed income world, but you can also see that the, the corporate world uh, is quite diverse uh, through uh, high grade, through region, through high yield, also structures of loans, and uh, that's uh, the darker, the darker, um, the darker circles. I uh, can see that there, there can be also quite, quite large markets. Um, the government bond have a huge impact on the credit market. And uh, I'll, I'll put that away by, uh, by looking at, the, at this graph. So the way we like to look at the performance of, the, of govies, government bonds, is, uh, is this graph where you can see the return and the yield, but the return is decomposed of uh, how much came from the coupon and how much comes, came from the, the change in, uh, in, in rate. And you can see, obviously, as the yield goes down, the coupon has been going down. And right now, as you can see, the, the coupon is offering very, very little, uh, not an expected return, but also buffer in case of, of rising rates. Uh, this environment is creating a huge demand for higher yields. And that's what uh, has driven the flow into credit in general. Um, here it's a graph, which is a, a a simple model that shows effectively how the, 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 the credit market can be mapped to the uh, uh, earning growth on the, uh, the S&P 500. So it's US high yield versus S&P 500. You can see that it matched pretty nicely. And you can see that recently, the spread, because it's an inverted scale, scale the, the spread has, has tightened a lot. That, that's an illustration of flows. I could, show, I could show you a graph of flow. You will see a huge, huge uh, inflows in high yield. That's been a, uh, an asset class or a sector that has been very, very high in demand. And indeed, you can see it on the, on the performance. Uh, the uh, performance has been steady. The, the, the coupon has been uh, reducing. And uh, despite the, the, the loss due to the duration last year, you had some credit spread tightening that helps. So the price return is, is close to flat. And effectively, investors last year were able to collect the coupon on the yield market. Another market that has seen a huge amount of inflows is the leveraged loan market. Uh, it didn't see much outflow last year, uh, contrary to other, other markets, because they are, in general, floating rates. And in an environment where rates go up, investors like the, the, the structure that are, uh, that are floating. Uh, Unfortunately for uh, investors, this is also a market that is less liquid. Uh, and typically, when you invest in leveraged loan, uh, you should expect to hold it till maturity, contrary to uh, an high yield bond or uh, any, an high grade bond, any form of bond where you have more an active market, uh, it's more fungible, so you, you can trade around. Leveraged loan, I would say it's, uh, it's essentially loan to, uh, to poor quality companies. Um, once an investor enter a loan, uh, you better invest uh, for the long run because trading will be expensive. You can see here the, the behavior of the leverage loan market. You can see it's been much more steady. Uh, there was a huge hiccup in 08. Uh, the funny story is that before 08, the investors in, in leverage loan were all thinking that it could never go below 95. Well, in, in 08, the uh, leverage loan market went to 70. 70 cents on the, on the dollar. So it's been a huge shock. And effectively, you can see the, the rebound has been quite strong. And the, the people that were able to hold on the paper uh, were fine. The people that were levered on leverage loan uh, 
lost a lot of money because they could not hold the position. So the leverage zone is, a, is, a, is an attractive market for uh, its floating rate uh, structure. The coupon is not particularly attractive today. Uh, what you sacrifice for this pickup you need is essentially the, the liquidity part. So the last traditional market I'd like to talk about is the emerging market, uh, emerging market debt. Um, this is an interesting market because you can see that on the flow chart, so that's the one on the left hand side, um, there has been a huge amount of inflows in the emerging market for uh, many, many years. And you can see that last year it, it came from the, the, the favorite market for investors to the, the most hated market with massive outflows. Um, Emerging market debt is very, very much uh, purchased by uh, uh, what um, can I say, foreigners. So U.S. European investors we invest in in, uh, in in Brazil, for example, and uh, that means that uh, it's very speculative. It's not necessarily for the very long run. And when you have a change in environment, this is one of the first market that suffers, and that's what we've seen last year. So. An emerging market debt investor would expect to have a, a, a diversification in its allocation, but what he had last year was essentially duration, U.S. duration. You can see it in the return um, on the uh, right-hand side, the, the bar just there. So this is the emerging market government bond uh, index. Uh, huge loss not only in, uh, in uh, spread but also in duration. Uh, contrary to credit high yield, for example, that you can see here, where you get the, the, the spread compression <coughs> compensated for the duration. So this is a highly speculative market, and uh, it has proven a, quite a, a poor instrument for, uh, let's say, uh, diversification of portfolios. Now let's go to the alternative credit strategies. Uh, what I'm going to try to address here is how can you target specific segments of the credit market to maybe improve your yield, or maybe, I would say, protect your portfolio. So the first strategy I'd like to talk about essentially is on the refinancing side. Um, it's very interesting to see that in 2013, uh, you can see on, the, on this pie chart that 57% um, of the issuance were uh, used for refinancing. So a, a huge, and there was a lot of issuance, and the, the, the huge amount of issuance, uh, most of the issuance, new issuance have been used to refinance and, and roll the debt forward. And that creates a real opportunity because there is huge demand for debt. The credit markets are very open. It's quite easy for a company to, uh, to issue because there is demand. And you can see on this graph here, uh, the, the red line is the yield of uh, the new issuance. So if you issue today, you have a 565. And 7.45 will be the average coupon uh, if of your current debt. So I'm, make, I'm simplifying, but that's for the sake of uh, the argument. So imagine you are a, a corporate company, you are a company, you have currently uh, a debt that has a coupon of 7.45. You have the opportunity today to roll, to refinance, to reissue a debt, to buy, the, buy back this old debt at 5.65 uh, yield. So to simplify, let's say a 5.65 coupon. That's very good from a cash flow standpoint, you save 2% per year. So a lot of companies are induced into refinancing. Uh, they are happy to make some, uh, to, to give up a bit of, uh, of money upfront for the, for the operation. And effectively, investors that are targeting companies that are going to refinance are going to make an extra, an extra return. So the strategy that has been very common in, uh, in many hedge funds has been to target companies that are quite poor quali quality, that will certainly default <coughs> in the next few years. But because the credit market is so open, these companies have the opportunity to roll their debt, to extend their debt. So what many investors have done is that um, they are somehow arbitraging the probability of default that this company has, because this company will, I mean, is very levered and might default in the future. So obviously, it has a higher spread than average. But at the same time, on the short term, on the next year, it's very unlikely that it defaults because it will refinance. So, and it's hard to reflect in the price. So this pickup in yield can be, uh, can, be, can be captured by this strategy. Um, what you're doing here when you're doing this strategy effectively is you are leveraging default risk. So there is many kinds of risk when you invest in credit. You have some duration, some credit spread duration, so the, the variation in the spread, and some default risk. If you target a very short dated bond, you have no duration, very little credit spread duration. And because it's a poor quality company, you have a high default risk. So by targeting that, you're exchanging the, the risk that you've seen on this graph here, which was essentially, uh, let's say, first graph is duration. Second graph will be the, the, the credit spread change. So imagine this uh, blue line here 
reverting back to the uh, let's say to the model based on uh, S&P uh, S&P earnings, you will have losses in high yield. Well, if you have a one-year bond, you will have much lower losses. Uh, I'll come back on scenarios and these strategies. This is a very bullish strategy for the status quo environment. If things stay the same, it's very efficient. Uh, if things change, it can be very uh, detrimental. Another strategy that uh, can help investors in the credit market is uh, to focus on distressed situation. So distressed investment is investment in companies that are uh, in trouble and that need restructuring. Essentially, you buy the debt of a good company with too much debt and uh, the company defaults, you restructure the company and you exchange the debt into new stock and you end up with the stock of a good company with no more debt, which is quite a, a powerful uh, uh, position. Uh, here you can see the issuance of the market on high yield and leverage loan, again on the US market. You can see that this year has been uh, uh, spiking again in terms of, uh, of issuance. It's been very, very active. And in general, when you have huge demand of, and huge volume of, uh, of new debt, you can expect that the debt is getting lower and lower in quality. Uh, you have also uh, uh, some statistics here in terms of mortality rate, so how much of the debt is defaulting after certain years. And here it's interesting to see that if you take a single B bond, on average, after four years, 24% of the bond have defaulted. And if you take a triple C bond after four years, on average, 45% have defaulted. So now if you go back to that and you look at the cycle, you can see that we are piling up for some uh, default in the future. What is preventing today default, essentially, is that we have a huge quantitative easing. It makes money plentiful, huge angriness for yield, and therefore huge demand for new bonds. That, I come back to the refinancing story, you're a bad company, you can refinance. It's no problem. The market is open. Um, another indicator in terms of declining quality that is very often looked at is uh, what we call covenant light. So when you issue a bond, I mean as a creditor, there are covenants, especially in loan that are uh, private by nature, or, say, or more bespoke. Um, as a senior creditor, you will, make sh you will put into the, the contract of the loan that the company should not over lever itself. The company should not make crazy acquisition just to control that, thing, that your, your, your money is safe. And, uh, if you are happy to take more risk, you can waive this covenant. You can say, well, no covenant or very light covenant. That's why we call it covenant light. And it's at the, at the, at the peak of the last credit bubble in 2007, there was 25% of new insurance were covenant light. Well, in 2013, we have 51% covenant light. That doesn't bode well in terms of credit quality. So there is no distressed opportunity really right now. The default projection is quite low because markets are very open, is no problem. But coming in the next few years, we can expect that there will be a distressed, uh, a, a distressed a wave of default, I would say. Uh, the first strategy I'd like to mention is lending. Uh, the current environment since 08 has seen the bank retrench dramatically for their core activity, which is lending to corporation. Um, you can see it here. Uh, this is a graph that's, that's on Europe. You can see that every basically year, three month period, uh, the, 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 loan act, lo the lending activity of banks is contracting. That leaves uh, a huge demand for loans that is not fulfilled by the banks, and therefore that leaves uh, uh, a place for uh, private money to, f to fill the gap. And effectively, there are some uh, funds uh, and some large corporations that are setting up uh, this banking activity to, lending to, uh, to lend to, uh, to a corporation. Um, <coughs> what's interesting today is that because there is a huge demand and little supply, obviously the spreads are very attractive on these strategies. And you can pick up a very nice extra yield. You totally sacrifice the notion of liquidity because if you make a loan to the company across the road, and it's a loan just between you and this company, it would be very hard to find investors that would be willing to buy this loan because it doesn't exist in the market. It's not actively traded. So that's really, really liquid. And it's more on the real, I would say, in terms of vehicle, of philosophy of investment, on the private equity side rather than, I would say, on the uh, fund, hedge fund side. Another strategy that is uh, interesting to mention in credit or in our sector is uh, the structured credit sector. Uh, it was uh, uh, booming just before 08. You can see the issuance on the, on the left side of uh, various uh, categories, especially uh, you can see on RMBS or residential mortgages in the US. Uh, it collapsed in 08, obviously, but it restarts. And uh, this sector is essentially driven by the hunger for yield. 
because by structuring uh, existing pool of debt, you can improve the yields just by the, the, the way you, you, can, you can structure things. You can put some more leverage into it also. And that's what you, you, what you see here. So we expect the uh, credit market, the structural credit market to continue to grow and to create opportunities because this is still a, a market that people uh, dislike a lot. And if it's a market that is disregarded, in general, that leaves some opportunity. I will put a little caveat on this one in the sense that this is still a very dangerous market. And I, I can tell you that for example, Unigestion, we have very limited exposure to this market. But this is an important market for, uh, to, to, to talk about in this, uh, in this session. Uh, all these strategies I mentioned were all about improving your, uh, your yield, so improving the yield pickup. Here, it's a strategy on the, that is the reverse. It's how do you exploit the fact that the yields are very compressed, the, coup, the spreads are very tight. Can you take advantage of it? Well, yeah, you can short. Shorting is very interesting in credit because first, it's very uncommon. Uh, credit investors, by definition, like to collect coupon, collect carry, and very few like to, uh, to pay this carry. So uh, very few players have uh, uh, the, um, uh, the mindset of, of shorting credit. Um, shorting credit is attractive today because there is not only, I would say, in this environment, the um, opportunities to spot companies that are going to default, but also you can buy companies, fine, by protection on companies that are very good and you can still make money. Here it's an example on Heinz, so it's a, it's a very strong company, it's a, it's a very good brand, it has a strong balance sheet, it's investment grade, it's consumer staple, so it's a nice and stable sector. Uh, the CDS five years, so the cost to insure your debt uh, over a year uh, for five years was 50 bips per year, so 50 basis points per year, sorry. And uh, well, last year there was an, uh, an LBO on this company, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, I think, uh, purchased the company, and the spread exploded because an LBO is a leveled buyout. So suddenly the level of debt of uh, Heinz has been uh, uh, increased dramatically and the spread moved from 50 to uh, 200. So essentially, uh, if you make uh, 150 basis points times the duration of the CDS, five, you're going to make 7.5%. So it's a very asymmetric trade. You, you, you risk 50 basis points to make 7.5. So on the shorting side, you can effectively short companies that are going to, you think, going to default. You're fighting effectively the willingness of uh, the easy or easy it is to refinance, but you can also short uh, companies that might be LBO, because a lot of the talk of uh, this year is about activism and, and uh, that all equity investors are going to, uh, to be more activist. And so a lot of LBO are, are expected to, uh, let's say, leverage the equity market. So that's, that's an attractive strategy if you want to edge your portfolio. The cost is quite low, uh, and uh, a lot of value added can be provided for, uh, with the right credit picking. Now if we look at environments, um, again, on a session like that, it's very difficult to make all the scenarios possible, so uh, we're going to look at three main scenarios. And the graph I like to use for that is a graph that I borrow from a, a website called Shadow Stats because uh, they, they continue to try to, to publish the M3. So M3 is a monetary mass in the US in the broadest sense, counting everything. And uh, it's nice to compare it versus the M1, which is, uh, the, the, I would say, the the, the tightest monetary mass measure, which is more like a, just a, at, the, at, the, at the treasury level. So what is interesting with this graph, and we look a little bit at the history, I mean, 04, 05, you can see the, uh, the growth of the, of the monetary mass on a measure as M1 and M3 is roughly the same, around 5%. Then you enter in 06, 07, and during this period, there is a huge amount of leverage deployed by the industry, uh, by banks. So velocity of money, the, multi the bank multiplier is massive, and you can see that the M3 is exploding. The uh, central bank is uh, trying to control it by effectively reducing the growth in, uh, in M1. So there is uh, some, even some rising rate during this period. Um, obviously, it collapsed in weight. Uh, there is a huge retrenchment on the financial market. You have uh, the M3 is collapsing and the central bank intervenes by putting a lot of money in the system through quantitative easing. There is a stabilization and now you can see uh, the direction that is taking. The M3 has uh, stabilized uh, a bit, but it's still uh, because there is a huge M1 and clearly one way to look at what the, target, the Fed is targeting is they would like certainly to land the M1 on the M3 towards 5%. So it's like a, a, a convergence of these two curves. They are going to withdraw money, or reduce their quantitative easing, and at the same time they expect the bank and the financial system to increase the velocity of money and the multiplier. So it's really a, a difficult landing. We were talking about uh, trillions of dollars, but that needs to, uh, to match. But that's possible. So the three scenarios are the following. The first scenario is that they are notable 
to make it happen. And we stay in this scenario where we have high M1 way higher than the M3. The velocity is not restarting. The, 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 the banks are not relanding. The financial market remain kind of broken. And they, they continue to, 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 to use quantitative easing to maintain the economy. So it's a statu quo scenario. Second scenario, they lose control, either because economy restart too strong and they are not able to uh, put the brake fast enough, or they put the brake too fast and they break it, but it's just they lose control. And the third scenario is that they manage to effectively make the M1 land on the M3. <coughs> so all are the strategy reacting to these three scenarios. Refinancing first. So refinancing in the status quo scenario, so as of today, well, it's great. You have ample liquidity. You can target the worst company ever. They will refinance. So you will pick up this extra, sp extra, extra spread by uh, buying the soon to be refinanced debt of poor companies. So that might be the most uh, attractive strategy uh, on this scenario. So to credit, well, because there is such an hunger for yield, the growth is going to be massive, the demand is going to be massive, and there will be a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, releveraging of the structure, and uh, we should expect good performance from structured credit again. Lending, lending is good. Uh, the bank are still staying away. If not, the multi uh, that would mean that uh, the M3 would have gone up. So uh, there is not uh, no competition from the bank. Uh, we can expect that over investors are spotting the same opportunity and are setting themselves up. So the risk effectively on lending is that uh, at some point it will be crowded out. And uh, the spread that you can make of, let's say, at 8% for lending to a good company or 6 8% going to go down to uh, 5 6 4 5 5 it will be arbitrage just because an opportunity like that will be arbitrage distressed little to do there is no default there is not much to do what we can expect on a status quo scenario on distressed the, the bright spot is that during during all the years since 2008 the bank have not sell have not sold the bad debt they have reinsured it they have used innovative way, let's say, to, um, to, uh, to reduce their uh, visual leverage, but they have not physically sold the bad assets. With the good performance of financial markets, the um, provision has been made, and now the bad assets can be, uh, can be sold because the losses have been provisioned. So these assets that are poor and need to be restructured will drip progressively to distressed players, and that will maintain a little bit of return. So there is a bit of return, to, to, a bit of money to make in distress, but it's, it's not a huge opportunity. Shorting, it will be almost impossible to make money shorting uh, credit because no default. Uh, the only hope is to pick uh, the LBO example. It's, it's, it's possible, but it's still difficult. So uh, small losses are, ex are to be expected from, uh, from shorting in such an environment. On the second scenario, which is uh, the central bank are losing control and we, it triggers a fixed income exodus, uh, you will have a, 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 a sell-off in most markets. Uh, the first market that will uh, suffer a lot is refinancing. If the first strategy that suffer is refinancing, because credit market will just stop to operate. This huge... Um, uh, ability to refinance will disappear and companies that should default will default. And all the companies that have pushed back this event will certainly default at the same time. So we'll have a huge, huge uh, stress on, on the corporate world. And not necessarily on the, on the investment grade, but there is a lot of small companies that will not survive. Structured credit, again, st credit markets are seizing. Uh, the risk premium link to complexity is going to be priced massively and uh, very, very heavy losses will be, uh, will be uh, generated. They are interesting, the difference between refinancing and structured credit is that in the refinancing uh, strategy, it's an actual default that's going to uh, cost money. So the money is lost. There is no hope of recovery. Uh, the loss is realized. In structured credit, it's more like a mark to market. Uh, situation. So the loss will be big, but will not be realized, will be unrealized. And if, if things get better, the loss will be recovered. In the lending uh, strategy, that's where the beauty of lending is, is that because it's outside the market, there is no mark to market. So in fact, this financial crisis that uh, I'm describing in this scenario will not affect necessarily the, the company across the road. So uh, if you've done your work on their uh, ability to uh, repay the debt, you'll be unaffected and even better. Given that the financial situation gets worse, your position will be stronger to uh, lend to even more companies at, a, at an even more attractive rate because of just supply demand. The demand will be uh, as strong and the supply will have collapsed. On the distress side, there will be initial market 
uh, mark to market losses because this trust manager typically will take advantage of this situation to purchase uh, assets from uh, the, the weakest end and therefore there will be losses as the uh, potential return of the strategy increase so it's a uh, it will be the strategy that becomes the most attractive post-crisis. Uh, it's hard to, 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 um, to time the bottom, so it will be a strategy that has a, a, a significant drawdown, but then a very, very, very strong rebound. Shorting, obviously, that's the best scenario. That's where you, the strategy is going to make very, very large gains. On the third scenario, uh, <coughs> control tapering. Well, refinancing will have a mediocre performance because uh, slowly but surely there will be default. Uh, the rationalization means that some companies, uh, that the worst companies will stop being able to refinance and uh, these small defaults will eat up the uh, extra performance that you were able to pick up. So, and slowly the, the, the strategy will go away with mediocre performance. On the structured credit should be benign. There is absolutely uh, uh, no reason that uh, there is a boom or a bust on this sector. Um, the return will be average, uh, and we should expect that if the, the normal cycle happen, there will be excess leverage building up to try to maintain returns by, uh, I would say, two, uh, two aggressive managers. On the lending side, that's the worst scenario, because banks will be back in business and will crowd out the private sector, and banks are much more efficient to lend, that's, that's their business, so uh, they will do it cheaper than you, and therefore you, you'll be priced out. On the distress side, uh, that's quite interesting, because there will, this scenario doesn't have a huge sell-off uh, before recovery. It's more like a, a let's say, a, a Goldilocks scenario. It's what we could expect, uh, the, the best scenario we can imagine. Um, but the, the market will not collapse uh, 40%, 20% on a, on a stress. But what will happen is that a company that should have defaulted will default, and default will drip over the next three to five years. So this stress cycle, in general, you have a big shock with a huge amount of default. In this scenario, you will have uh, a regular amount of default every year for a couple of years. So instead of making 30%, 40% in a, in a good year for distress, you might make 15, but instead of for three years. So instead of making, let's say, 45 in one year, you'll do uh, 15 for three years. So it's, it's still a, a decent scenario. On the shorting side, well, the negative carry that you have should be offset by some gains, but it's, it's not particularly attractive in this scenario. So you can see every strategy has pros and cons. And uh, what we find interesting, in fact, is that when you look at uh, what how a strategy perform and how you can um, understand his behavior in various environments, it's particularly attractive to see if, how you can mix and match them. So think about it. distress was a very nice strategy in terms of uh, how it will behave in the um, third scenario, control tapering, which is, let's say, you trust the central bank will do the right thing. It's also not such a bad strategy in the first scenario because there will be a bit of return. The only problem is that in the second scenario, when there is a sell-off, it suffer a lot before recovering very strong. If you can take off a little bit of the drawdown during the sell-off, it would be a great strategy. Shorting only works during the sell-off. So in fact, when you match both, you have a very nice portfolio. The, uh, distressed investment on the long side, shorting, very tight spread. And effectively, that's a strategy that many hedge funds are doing on the long-short credit side. Uh, they are picking stocks, uh, or bonds, sorry, that are uh, uh, particularly undervalued and not really crowded. Uh, last year, for example, the best trade you could do on the credit side was effectively to purchase the, the preferred shares of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It's clearly a distress situation. Uh, and shorting basically edge all the, the, the risk uh, on, uh, let's say, the, the tightest credit you can find to edge the systemic risk. On the other hand, lending is another strategy that matches very well with structured credit because on the lending side, the problem is it's a nice strategy, but the problem is there is a high risk of being crowded out, so there is a risk of disappointing returns if, uh, if things get too tight. Uh, circuit credit allow you effectively to secure financing, to put some leverage on it. And for example, the, the best example I can give as an illustration is that if a bank today doesn't want to lend to a, to a, to a company, it's because it costs too much on its balance sheet in terms of, uh, of ratio. So it's, they try to optimize their balance sheet, and th that's basically what uh, prevents them to, uh, to lend more to, to companies. Um, as a private investor, you can lend to the company. And in fact, for the bank, lending to you as a private investor costs less on their ratio than lending to the company. So they can lend to you so that you lend to the company. In fact, the bank end up lending to the company, but through you as an intermediary. When I say you, I'm talking about a private investor, through a fund. And uh, we can put two turn of leverage 
on a very good quality loans and to have a pickup of, uh, of yield that would be attractive, the leverage being secured for the duration of the loan. So that's also things that can be very, very uh, interesting to Max. Uh, on this point, I would uh, like to uh, hand it over to you and see if you have uh, any question. What do you consider the most probable scenario? <laughs> um, I have a hard time believing that the central banks don't know what they're doing because that's something we hear sometimes. They are not, and uh, I think they know what they're doing and I do not bet against them. So I think, the, and we have to be optimistic, I think the scenario three is, uh, is uh, the most likely, but there is a definite risk of uh, them to fail. But, uh, but if you have to, to, to make a most probable, I would say that the these very intelligent people that have a huge, huge army of uh, economists and uh, scientists uh, should be able to pull it off. Uh, where is event risk uh, in unworked scenarios? So, for instance, uh, I don't know, China going to the gold standard or something like that. <laughs> or you... Okay. Uh, yeah, that's an external scenario, but that uh, you'll end up in this. I mean. Uh, I mean, it's such a huge event, uh, you know, if you go uh, World War or this, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a crisis scenario. Um, it's very small probability. It's hard to do anything with it. So the, the best thing you can do is make sure that uh, your, um, your risk management is tight enough to, uh, at, I mean, you will lose money in this kind of scenario. So is it, how bearable can it be? Um, European distress supply um, driven by asset quality review, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, that will happen. The, 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 the trick is that uh, already in the, late, in the early 90s, there was a, everybody was expecting uh, a boon from uh, the, the German banks uh, that had a lot of bad debt. In, and uh, as a as a hedge investor and talking to the hedge market, I, I never really saw it coming. Um, and it, it never really materialized because, in fact, it, it's done behind closed door. Uh, in two years ago, there was the idea that uh, the banks had so much bad assets they needed to get rid of it. And uh, everybody was expecting uh, what we call BWIC, so bid wanted in competition, which is like a public auction. But this is crazy, this will never happen. Uh, what happens is they, they go to people they trust, uh, that they are used to work with, they show their book, they discuss, and they try to, uh, they try to offload the assets discreetly uh, with uh, people they have confidence with. So that will not be a, a huge you know, uh, opportunity where you, you everybody, that will be very public. But there will be uh, an offload of this debt progressively as they have built the provision and uh, they, they, they need to offload the bad debt to uh, be able to reoperate properly. What's very interesting is that uh, the last few years really on the banks, uh, regu regulatory capital operation, so in, in our jargon we, we call it red cap, essentially the banks invite someone to come, they open the book, and uh, so the external uh, professional uh, will effectively act as a reinsurer. He will, he, will, he will select a part of the book and he will, he, will, uh, he will take the first loss on this book that will tremendously improve the ratio of the bank without really removing the ultimate risk of the, of the paper. And uh, the trick is that the, the person that pick the names, pick good names. So the, the ratio are, are a bit uh, blind. I mean, they, 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 uh, they don't make fundamental analysis. I mean, it's, uh, it's based on ratings and, uh, and uh, automatic, uh, automatic things. So um, they can, they tr this optimization, they're optimizing their ratio using uh, uh, reinsurance techniques. That's what happened in the last few years. I opinion that they've done it to the, uh, as much as they could. Now they need to off offload, the, offload the assets. And amongst distressed funds, there was a lot of sort of asset raising, but the opportunities didn't materialize. Those, is there a lot of dry powder in the stress? Oh, there's a lot of dry powder, but we didn't see so much. Uh, we saw uh, asset raising on more effectively on a private equity structure. For the two years ago, uh, people were creating funds that uh, were going to target specifically the offload from the bank, which I don't know what they did with the money effectively because uh, there was very little. Uh, but more the traditional distressed funds. Uh, and to give us, you an idea of how we think, um, a, a distressed fund today has two choices. It can either find the market, the market is expensive, so it can either recognize it and say, well, I will reduce my exposure 
and have only 50% uh, of my portfolio invested, but he will invest in, uh, I would say, uh, very high octane uh, securities. Or he can say, well, I don't know what to do with my money, and therefore I'm going to the next uh, level of my expertise, and uh, I will be lending. So I will enter in uh, illiquid loans. This, the second category is a disaster. Because the, the value of a distressed investor is effectively to have this uh, uh, value approach when, when the market gets expensive, he builds dry powder, and when the market collapses, he will be buying when everybody else is saying. Uh, the distressed investors that lock himself in illiquid loans uh, will go bankrupt when the, when the, the market goes down. And that's what happened in 0708. Very, very large distressed funds, which were very famous, the one was called Plainfield. Uh, basically, they would not accept that the return was not there, so they needed to engineer it. So they levered the book with uh, more illiquid strategies. Unfortunately, they were not the only one. And all these ones have disappeared, essentially. So it's very important for us when we look at how they behave to see that they are behaving in the right way, which is uh, raise cash. That's normal to raise cash right now. Please. I'm trying to help get my head around your scenario one again. Um, what happens if, when we actually see a, a differentiation of the central bank strategies, like between uh, the, the US, uh, where, where we will probably sooner than see some tapering and the ECB, uh, which will have to carry on for, uh, for a long while to tell the, the bank Japan. Yeah, but so, yeah, the US already uh, tapered by 20 billion per month. Uh, they're still injecting 65 billion per month, so it's still, uh, it's not like uh, they have removed liquidity really. But uh, yes, uh, the, the macro anticipation is that the US is more on a, on a recovery side when the Europe has still a lot, when Europe has still a lot to do. Uh, but it's the same scenario for every, every country. I mean, the one which is maybe the most advanced is Japan, uh, that is on a ultimate QE and trying to get the, the velocity of money to, uh, to go up. Um, the history of Japan has, uh, is interpreted as that the, um, every time they had a, a start of a recovery, they, they tightened too fast. And our opinion is that the, the Fed right now, they are tapering a bit. But if they have bad numbers economically, I will not be surprised. We go back from 65 to 75. I mean, they will be very reactive. That's why, the, for me, the third scenario will be the they will do whatever it takes. I don't think they, they are dogmatic in the sense that they, they apply a school of thought and. Uh, they apply it, and then whatever happens, happens. Uh, they, they, they want to pilot things. Uh, not, not exactly my question. I was wondering, uh, you're really looking at the US market, at least from all the charts. Yeah, because it's a bigger one, yeah. Of course. Uh, but is there a differential uh, breaking up uh, with, with those differential monetary regimes? Financial markets are international nowadays. So um, if you have a, a demand or a, on the credit side in Europe, the money can come from the US. So uh, it's quite fluid. Uh, what I mean, you can look at it as uh, when we look at QE, you can, you, we should look at QE worldwide. So we need to US, uh, Europe, Japan, China, UK to, to a lesser extent. Uh, NC basically is uh, the world continue to continue to print money. Um, China wants to remove shadow banking, so that's tightening, tightening uh, effect. So yes, yeah, so right now we have an interesting situation where not everybody is in the same direction. I don't think there is that much impact for credit in itself uh, because uh, money is moving around the world. Uh, much more impact on the currencies, uh, so on the macro side. So uh, it's another subject, but for macro investors, that would be a great news to see different cycles across the world. From? As an instrument. <laughs> In what sense? Well, if there were, uh, if some uh, some company introduced some capital flow controls, obviously the big ones would be very difficult. Uh, yeah, I'm not qualified to. Uh, that's, uh, that's beyond my uh, competency, this kind of reflection. The only one I know about is Iceland, because there is a, there is a deal on the liquidation <coughs> of their bank. And uh, effectively, the problem is that uh, uh, well, a lot of uh, private investors, a lot of hedge funds are owning, uh, um, let's call it debt of uh, lands banking and copting, so the, the different uh, Icelandic bank. Uh, they are going to recover money. The problem is that they are going to recover Icelandic corona. 
<laughs> if you pull it back, they're going to destroy the currency. So the government is very scared of uh, basically uh, settling with the uh, with these foreign investors that will suddenly eat the currency. So that's a little bit of control on the on the currency side. Uh, but it's very unclear what's going to happen here. Last question. Or if you still have a question that you would not like to have on the video, you can ask it now, then we will take it out. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, I would say let's give a hand. Thank you. Thank you.